Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Alan Solomon. I'm the Dean of the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life. It's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's panel discussion, The Civic State of the Union, featuring some of the nation's leading experts on the civic and democratic life of our country. Robert Putnam, Shirley Sagawa, Tisch's own Peter Levine, and moderated by renowned journalist Mara Eliasson. Um, for anybody who's been looking at the slides that were up there before, um, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, or CIRCLE, which is housed at Tisch College, um, just released uh, tomorrow the results of a survey that we did of young voters in the 2016 election. We surveyed a national sample of young voters back in October, and we resurveyed essentially the same group of young voters in December to try to understand how the millennial generation experienced the 2016 election so we can figure out how to better engage the largest block of eligible voters in America today in our politics and our democracy. So uh, you can get more information about this on, at civicyouth.org, uh, but the material that you'll see is really rich and interesting and tells us a lot about the significant differences in how young people um, view things today. I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. I want to acknowledge my Tisch colleagues, especially Jess Burns and Jen McAndrew, uh, who, uh, who work on all of our Tisch events and especially for working so hard to organize tonight's program. I'm especially pleased to welcome, there are a lot of friends in the audience, but there are two very special friends that I just want to acknowledge. Phyllis Siegel, who's currently working with Encore.org. Where is Phyllis? Hi, Phyllis. Uh, Encore.org is, um, is to an, an organization that helps people of my generation uh, figure out what they're going to do for an Encore. Uh, and also Dorothy Stoneman, who is the founder and CEO, former CEO of the incredible service organization, uh, Youth Build. It has been a very busy couple of months for Tisch College. Today's forum is the fourth uh, in our Distinguished Speaker Series this semester, a series which brings to campus leaders from various fields to share their insights and to discuss with the Tufts community the most pressing public issues of the day. In January, we hosted United States Senator and Vice Presidential Candidate Tim Kaine who shared his thoughts on the state of national politics and America's role in the world. When I asked him how he liked being a candidate for vice president, he said it was the greatest experience in his life up until the last two hours. <laughs> last month, we welcomed Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker to campus for a spirited discussion on state government, bipartisanship, and the value of diverse opinions in today's polarized public square and we had some diverse opinions expressed that evening. Just last week, in partnership with Tufts Hillel, we heard from Marion Wright Edelman, founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund, who reminded us that a nation's greatest moral commitment must be to its children. And tomorrow morning, by the way, at 8.30 in the morning, I invite you to join me and President Monaco at 51 Winthrop Street for the Tufts Presidential Symposium on Community Partnerships where we will discuss the implications of new federal policy on local communities. At tonight's event, we take a step back from considering specific issues and policies in order to examine the broader context of civic and political life in the United States. Is the civic state of the union strong? And if not, how do we go about strengthening it in these times that challenge our democracy? At Tisch College, we believe that one answer to that question is to elevate the role of young people in the civic and political life of our country. In and out of the classroom, we prepare students at Tufts University to contribute responsibly and constructively to the civic life of their communities, their nation, and the world. Our research, led by Dr. Peter Levine, one of tonight's panelists, helps us better understand civic engagement and political participation in order to design strategies to improve them. And this knowledge, created and shared by faculty, students, and partners in the community, informs our practice 
and strengthens our efforts to solve the most pressing problems that cha challenge our community and our nation. We do believe that the stronger our civic life is, the more just and equitable our world becomes. And we're fortunate that leading scholars, practitioners, journalists, and citizens, such as tonight's guests, share that conviction. And we are here to share their knowledge and expertise, for them to share their knowledge and expertise with us. Robert Putnam is the Malcolm Professor of Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. He was once called by the London Sunday Times the most influential academic in the world today. And I don't know why that was a once called. I'll call him that tonight. <laughs> he has done pioneer, pioneering work on tops, topics like educational inequality and social capital, which, which is the subject of his best selling book, Bowling Alone, The Collapse and Revival of American Community, which was published in 2000. And this whole civic, this whole interest in civic engagement that has been rekindled in the academy, I think can be, can trace its roots to uh, Bob Putnam's book at that time. Uh, it did spark a movement to rethink America's civic health. Uh, Professor Putnam noted the steep drop in the number of bowling leagues even as the number of individual bowlers increased. And he argues that it demonstrates the decline of traditional civic and social organizations that once created valuable bonds that enable people to work together towards common goals. I hope we can talk this evening about what can replace bowling leagues. Bob Putnam's wisdom and insight has been sought out by American presidents and British prime ministers. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences past president of the American Political Science Association and a recipient of the National Humanities Medal. His latest book, Our Kids, The American Dream in Crisis, which I recommend to everyone, paints a very sobering picture of the inequality of opportunity in the United States today. Shirley Sagawa is one of the, our nation's leaders in the field of national and community service. She is currently the president and CEO of the Service Year Alliance, which aims to make civilian national service a common experience for young Americans. The Tufts One Plus Four Bridge Year Service Program was inspired by the work of Shirley and her colleagues. She is also a fellow at the Center for American Progress and she teaches social innovation at Georgetown University. Under President Clinton, Shirley served on the White House Domestic Policy Council and she helped draft the legislation that created AmeriCorps. She was then appointed the founding managing director of the Corporation for National Community Service, which houses AmeriCorps as well as other domestic service programs, including VISTA and Senior Corps. Shirley is the author of several books, including The American Way to Change, How National Service and Volunteers Are Transforming America. Peter Levine is the Associate Dean for Research and the Lincoln Filene Professor of Citizenship and Public Affairs, Public Affairs or Public Service actually, at Tisch College. Together, Peter and I are the Willie Lomans of democracy. That's a much more appropriate <laughs> term. Uh, Peter also holds an appointment in the philosophy department here at Tufts. He is indeed one of the intellectual leaders in the civic studies movement, which is an emerging interdisciplinary field that develops ideas and ways of thinking that are helpful to citizens as they seek to co-create a better world. At the University of Maryland, he helped found the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, or CIRCLE, which he brought to Tufts and to Tisch College in 2008. Under his leadership, CIRCLE has become the country's leading nonpartisan source of research on the civic and political engagement of young people, especially underserved and marginalized youth. His latest book is We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For, The Promise of Civic Renewal in America. And last but certainly not least is tonight's moderator, Mara Liason, national political correspondent for National Public Radio, whose reports frequently appear on award-winning news magazines like All Things Considered and Morning Edition. Mara provides in-depth coverage of politics and policy from Washington, D.C., focusing on the White House and Congress, and she also reports on political trends beyond the Beltway. She has covered seven presidential elections and served on, as NPR's White House correspondent during both terms of the Clinton presidency. All of our panelists deserve a lot more 
comprehensive introduction than we have time for, and you didn't come here to hear me. So I encourage you to learn more about their work online. Uh, I know you're all anxious to start, so please help us welcome Robert Putnam, Shirley Sagawa, Peter Levine, and Mara Elias. Well, thank you for coming here. This is on. Yes, okay. Thank you for coming out tonight. I'm really excited to be here with people that I really admire uh, and know about. <laughs> um, so there's actually a lot of suspense in this evening because we don't know if we're gonna leave here completely depressed <laughs> or with little bits of hopefulness about the civic state of the union. And I just wanna make a couple, couple brief remarks and then we're gonna have this discussion and then at about quarter of seven, we're gonna open it up and uh, take questions from you. Um, civic state of the union is something that I really care about a lot. And um, especially, even though this is something that, that our panelists have been dealing with and studying for many, many years, uh, since November 8th, uh, it's become kind of a burning question, certainly for me. I mean, not only do I feel like I'm covering this every single day in my job as the national political correspondent, but I've also been into my kids' high school to rant and rave at the principal and the head of curriculum about why they should don't have a civics curriculum K through 12. This is a really pet peeve of mine. And I don't want this evening to be all about Donald Trump, but... Um, if Donald Trump is a stress test for democratic institutions, one thing that I have been uh, watching or I feel that is kind of the big meta story that I'm covering is how are those democratic institutions doing? And, um, you know, I'm watching the independent judiciary who he has, I mean, all of them, of course, he's vilified in one degree or another, but independent judiciary so far, so good. Congress, mixed. Press, we're doing our job. Um, the, the, and the fourth one are citizens. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Okay. We um, know that we've seen the studies. Young people are losing faith in democracy. You know, we've seen all of those depressing indicators. And certainly Bob has been telling us about all these depressing indicators for many, many years. On the other hand, look what's happening. Those town halls are not AstroTurf. Um, you know, people are saying they're going to run for office, even if it's dog catcher or school board. Um, you had this, these big demonstrations. Now we know that in the past there have been big demonstrations that have led absolutely nowhere. But, you know, we don't know what exactly to make about all of these stirrings. Um, people are learning about what democracy is. It's not just one election. It's a whole series of institutions. And, you know, they say checks and balances is a metaphor, not a mechanism. They only work if somebody makes them work. And people, I think, citizens are getting a real education about what democracy is and isn't. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. And I think I'd like to start just by asking each of you to talk about what's happened since the late 90s. Since you wrote your book, Bob, about the deep decline in American civil life, since America or got underway in 1994, and what you've seen in your association, Peter, with Circle, um, you know, wh where have we come from and how would you describe the moment we are in right now? So that's kind of big picture. And why don't you start, Bob? Um, well, let me say three things. Um, the basic trends that I described in Bowling Long, which is that people were disconnecting from one another. And from, oh, here. Oh, yeah. No, no, I got it. I want to say three things. First of all, um, the basic descriptions of trends in civic life, not just bowling leagues, but all sorts of things family dinners and dinner parties and and um, going to town meetings and so on. The underlying secular trend, at least until uh, 2017, has been down. 
uh, and so in that sense, I am still a secular pessimist. By secular pessimist, I mean I think the fundamental trend has been going in that direction. But I think there, the other two things that I want to say are want to complicate that picture. I'm happy to talk about whether I was even right in, in Bowling Alone, but I, I'm prepared to defend that. But um, secondly is the internet, and there's been a lot of discussion. Ever, the internet, I mean, social media and so on, the internet basically occurred just after I wrote Bowling Alone, and, and people often say, well, so, you know, okay, so we don't have bowling leagues, we've got Facebook. And it's quite complicated. I'm not going to try to talk all about what I would say if I had an hour to talk about the internet and, and, um, and connections, but um, because there are parts of the internet that are really bad for civic engagement and there are parts of the internet that are really good for civic engagement, but thinking about it in that binary term, and I've said this for a long time, is actually misleading to think about either connection, either face-to-face -face or internet connections. What we've been looking for are alloys, that is, networks that are partly face-to-face -face and partly real. Tahrir Square was largely not face-to-face. -face. In Tahrir Square, there were three groups, one of which had internet connections, that was the, those were the liberals, and two of which had non-internet connections, and that was the, the Muslim Brotherhood and the Egyptian army. And I said at the time to my wife, uh, two of those are real, and they're going to be determining the future of Egypt. And that third, though, the, I, there are people in that movement in Tahrir Square that I knew as students and I loved, and I think they were the saints, but they didn't have the connections. So purely internet connections, I believe, are not adequate. But, and we could talk more about this, I think that what we're seeing now out in the country is a wonderful um, amalgam of uh, internet-based connections, that's how everybody learns about these things, but also real face-to-face -face connections. And I'm not, only, I, I'm not actually so impressed by the marches or, or demonstrations um, or tweet storms or that's not what's going to turn the country around. What's going to turn the country around is real people connecting with other real people, neighbors, to try to do things in their community. And that's what I see happening. I think it's the underreported story. I would give civil society, by which I don't mean just the internet part, by in fact, I don't mean the internet part, I mean civil society, an A in that, in that list of things. I'd give, I, you're, I'm an a. yeah, I give, I do. I think that it's much, I think there's much more face-to-face -face organizing going on around the country right now than we yet have realized because I'm not being critical of the media for goodness sakes, so I give you guys an A or A minus, but I wouldn't give Congress any, I wouldn't give Congress. Don't we give them a C plus? Yeah. Um, okay, but I didn't want to get there. I just want to say that what I really want to focus on, I want to just tell um, just a couple of stories, uh, very brief stories. My daughter is um, an academic. She's a chairman of the history department at Pitt. Uh, she's also active, and she is now spending much of her time. She's also a mother and um, with a young daughter, and she's a, trying to you know manage her professional life. She's spending many hours each week in meetings organizing Allegheny County. Allegheny County is not a trivial place. It's it's there. Are, it's Trump country, and as well as a lot of other countries, but it's, and their problem now is how can they manage the number of people who want to get involved? And secondly, how can they link that to the Democratic Party? Because it's, I'm gonna not be my usual nonpartisan self here. It won't do any good if it doesn't get connected with the engines of politics. Um, but, and then I just last night was talking with my sister-in-law who's out in, in Los, lives in Los Angeles. They last Sunday held a, dinner, a party for that they thought we were gonna have 12 people show up and 30 people showed up to the dinner party for the same reason. And you multiply that, of course it's more coastal and it's more blue and, than red and we really need those organization, organizations happening in red um, parts of America too. But I would not myself have predicted after this horrendous election, that what would happen was not just protest, but people getting together, the indivisible, not, is it called indivisible? That, 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 that pamphlet is a great pamphlet. Um, so I'm actually 
much more optimistic than I think you would might have expected me to believe, be, because this is actually what it looks like when countries turn corners. I, that's what I, I mean, seeing this in a historical perspective, I've always said that I thought that the, it wasn't that America had been going downhill forever in civic engagement. There were pre, uh, other periods in our life in which we have seen renewed civic engagement based on social mobilization. And so I'm not offering guarantees here, but I think this could be, this is what it would look like if we were about to see a turning point. I have another point to make that I'm not going to make now, but I hope I can get to back, which is we cannot, we, we cannot, I'm going to, I just want to get it on the record. We cannot, I, I saw you, you had this, the survey of young voters. What's really important is we not forget about young non-voters. And, and, um, and so maybe we can also talk about that. The, 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 the members of the millennial generation who are not connected and who are not, um, don't feel part of this country. That's what we also need to th think about that. I'm, I'm sorry I talked so long. Shirley. Okay, thanks. Um, just a couple, one thing I wanna say about the voters, I think this is the first election in which people actually decided not to vote and that was a form of civic engagement in making that choice. And it makes me super sad, but I, I think that that's different than, when I first got into this, I, you know, right out of law school uh, working on Capitol Hill, um, part of the reason that we were able to marshal support for the first national service legislation was there was a lot of anxiety that, that young people weren't voting. And it wasn't because they were deciding not to vote, they just didn't think it was important and they just didn't bother. So I think there's something interesting in that, which I, I know you're doing all this research on it, so I won't pontificate about it. I'm just... That, that really strikes me as a thing. Um, I, I want to say about national service, which is the thing I spend time on. When I first started working on national service, um, it, there was it, 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 it was definitely thought of as a civic tool. By the time we got to passing AmeriCorps and launching it, which was 1994 when the first AmeriCorps members were sworn in by President Clinton, um, and Eli Siegel was leading the Corporation for National Service, Phyllis's late husband and my great friend. Um, the motto was getting things done. So it had, it had been a very different frame, which was, you know, this is a way you can go out and, and make a difference and policymakers ought to support this because it's a really great way to solve America's problems cost effectively. Um, fast forward to the Serve America Act, which um, you know, I had the chance to work on as well, and then the sort of period that followed, we made a very deliberate switch to start talking about the benefits of serving for the young people themselves. This is a route to jobs. This is the way you learn skills. This is the way you meet new people, whatever it is. And, and that had a lot to do with the where young people were at the time. And that's, you know, the millennials were coming of age and that was who we were trying to recruit. And it was, it was quite clear, and it still is today, that people who are choosing to serve expect a lot out of it that's not, and it could be because they have debt, they have, uh, it's a big sacrifice to do. I mean, and, and it, you don't get paid very much and it's a choice. And, and if you're going to make that choice, you actually need it to be not a setback in your career. You don't need your parents saying you shouldn't have done this. If you're a first in your family to go to college, you don't need to be jeopardizing everybody's sacrifices. And if you are a young person who didn't have any opportunities at all, this better lead you somewhere good. So it really was a bit of a, 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 a shift in the trend and one that we've worked on as I'm running Service Year Alliance. Now we've done a ton of polling and that is what's necessary. Um, sort of the, the, the latest twist though, I think happened in the run up to this election. And, and it is a reason why our, our, our board chairman is General Stanley McChrystal, who is a, a wonderful American. And he has a lot of friends in the military who are deeply, deeply worried about this country and committed to national service as a strategy. And the reason is that, you know, they say, and I, I didn't have the benefit of serving in the military, but it's certainly been what I've heard over many decades, that you get into the military and you are thrown in with a bunch of people from different parts, of, from Oklahoma and Boston and, you know, Hawaii and all these far-flung places, and you meet people you wouldn't otherwise have met, and you, they have to, you know, they, you need to have their back, and they they have your back and you come out with a deep, deep affection for a group of people who you might have gone in having deep skepticism or concern about. Um, so their vision is that this is what civilian national service should do. And so, you know, with this election, 
it's only accelerating concern and people's support for this kind of work because of that purpose. So um, the only other thing I'll say about the um, what's different now is I think young people are different now in an interesting way. So you know, back when I was getting out of college, you had a very bifurcated life. You you did a job that was supposed to be, you know, whatever, make money, live. You had your social life and your family. And then maybe you did something specific to volunteer. And it was usually a defined thing. There are lots of organizations that got set up during that period of the 80s to kind of help people find stuff to do as volunteers. So it points of light came out of that period, right? Today, I think, and, and our, again, our research shows us we do tons of market research to try to get young people to want to do service. And young people today have a very 360 view of their cause orientation and their civic participation in the world. They do not divide up my government service with my other stuff. It's like, it's political. And, and some of you will know, like, you think about what you eat and it's political what you eat. You think about where you shop and it's political where you shop. Um, you think about kind of, you know, what you do do online and you're much more like we're at trying to get people to mobilize using Twitter. We see that as civic activist, you know, activation that's tied to specific policy outcomes. So, you know, it's, it's very much less a, you know, you do, you do this over here and you do this over here and you do this over here, then this is who I am as a person. And it's manifested in what I have for dinner and what I, where I buy my clothes and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I just want to throw that on the pile. You know, what's so interesting about that, and Peter, maybe you could pick up on that, is uh, <coughs> Shirley just described a generation that is super political and realizes that every single thing they do is that way. Then how come they didn't turn out in the numbers they should have this time? Although, I agree with Shirley, so many of them thought not not voting was a choice. It wasn't out of apathy. It was a choice, a choice that they hopefully now have learned was incredibly consequential. Apparently... According to Jennifer Granholm, something like 45,000 or 75,000, and I can't remember which number it was, ballots in Michigan, straight Democratic ballots, left the presidential line blank. Um, so it was a protest vote to not vote or to vote for every other office except for president. Um, or you thought she was going to win, so you voted for him just for the hell of it. You know, whatever. Or you thought she was going to win, so you didn't vote at all. But anyway, Peter... Uh, explain sure, yeah. that generation. Uh, I don't know if I can explain the generation. I, um, you asked how things had changed over, or what we'd learned over the last 20 years. So one thing I want to say is Bob was right. So uh, when I came up in the profession, that was a huge debate about the thesis. And it was a good debate, and it was complicated. There were empirical questions. Was the trend right? And there were also that kind of value questions. Are we, are we talking about the right thing? And I think the last, I mean, I'm not just being polite. I say this to other people as well. I think the last 20 years have proven that that was correct. And in fact, that there's a line between what he found in the 90s and the, and the, uh, the current election, that there was a hollowing out of democratic institutions, which led us to the impasse we're, we're in. Um, two things that I think have happened that have just happened, been mentioned by my two colleagues, although they're right about everything they said, um, but, but interesting, just didn't come up. One is the, the class divide, yes. which, which, right, which Bob's written a whole book about, but that got worse and worse. So a lot of the hollowing out is among working class Absolutely Americans. Right. In fact, almost all of it is. So just as a little talking point, um, I was interested in how many people are either in a union or in a church or both. And that went down by 20 points between the 1970s and this election. And it went from a majority. So most people, most, most households had somebody who was in a union or a church or both, and now we're down to 34%. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with um, what's happened. The other thing is, is, a, is a, perhaps an explanation in a way for the deeper, the longer term trends, the secular trend is, is a turn towards greater and greater um, uh, levels of choice at a kind of micro level. So it used to be that, you know, if you were lived around here, you, you subscribed to the Boston Globe, you subscribed to the Boston Herald, or you didn't subscribe to anything. And if you subscribed to the Boston Globe, you got a paper on your front door, which gave you the sports, the news, and the new, it gave you headlines on the front page. It gave you the same headlines they were reading down the street. Now the choice is what paragraph of which article to forward to which people, right? So everything is desired. And that's not just true of, I think it's true to some extent of faith, although you also wrote a book about that, which I'm trying to remember. But um, so, so a lot of the, and of course, things like unions are just sh shuttered. So a lot of um, the situation we're facing is one of a very precise individual choice, which is wonderful if you're all ready to make that choice. But Two bad things happen. One is people who are politically involved make choices that corral them into very similar groups. 
So you're, you're, you're only reading the same things that your friends are reading. But the second problem that's less often talked about is that a lot of people just choose not to have anything to do with politics whatsoever. So I think that's, that's actually my answer to your question about the generation, um, is that it's a, it's a choice. So there were lots of, there were lots of young people who did vote. Actually, the turnout trend has been surprisingly flat for 30 right. years, but lots of people do vote. Some of them are hyper engaged and that's what we're seeing in the post, in the post election. Right. Engage some of them, of course, in in partisan or electoral ways, some of them in explicitly anti-electoral ways, but it's tremendously bifurcated or not just bifurcated, multiplied. Um, lots and lots of little subcultures with a strong element of racial and class division am among them. So these are not usually heterogeneous subcultures. Right. Well, if, if we're talking about if the answer to civic disengagement is more shared values, more shared experiences, more connectedness, more aggregation, because we're all disaggregated in our little internet silos with our phones. So what is the way to do that? I mean, I actually always have been a believer in compulsory national service with a non-military component. I've always believed that. Of course, the military doesn't want that. It would be a total nightmare for them, but I believe that. Um, so <coughs> how do we get more connectedness? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, um, I'm a fan of national. I'm a fan of national service. I'm not really on the board or something of this. You're on the leadership council of our organization. So I'm. You're, Thank I, you. you're not going to hear me saying anything negative about national service. But I do think we have to diagnose. We have to be a little more precise about where the problem is. And forgive me. I am going to just briefly, just not because it's my book, but because I think it's crucial. The book Our Kids shows that. In domain after domain, there are what with these scissors graphs. Things are going up for the upper third of America, and the kids from the upper third of American side. That's my grandchildren. They are wonderful. They're connected. They're terrific. But that's the upper third. The lower third, not the lower one percent. But I mean, we're not talking about homeless kids. I'm talking about what we used to call the working class. Those kids are increasingly disconnected from everything from their parents because they're living in fragile or, or fractured families, from their schools because they're going to schools that are terrible, they're from, from um, sports because they're no longer able to afford to play extracurricular activities, they're from, from their neighbors because they're living in increasingly concentrated in dangerous neighborhoods, they're just disconnected. They don't have either friends, I'm exaggerating, but not much actually, and certainly I'm not exaggerating by comparison to my grandchildren who are in that upper third. And those kids are pissed. That's a technical scientific, social scientific term. And, and in, for doing this, the, the book, Our Kids, we had to interview a lot of those kids. And I'm just gonna mention one, a woman named Mary Sue, comes from my hometown. She's a working class kid in my hometown. She's got a terrible story. It would just, it's, it would have you crying if I told you about her story. She came from a, her, from a very fractured family, working class family, except they're no longer working. Um, she has nobody in her life. She, she's she been in prison. She's had several kids of her own. She's 18 and she's had several kids of her own. She's, and she doesn't have any future at all, really. She, she didn't, doesn't even have a high school degree. This is in my hometown, which is a small little place. She's white. This is not, I'm, I'm talking white working class. And she voted for Trump. Well, sure. And the, in, the, in the book, Our Kids, I said at the end of it, this was way before any of us heard of Trump was when I was drafting that chapter. I said, if you combine two things, great economic um, uh, need, disadvantage, and social isolation, people who closely studied the 1930s in Europe said that was what produced support for, and this is what I said, if we don't do something about the Mary Sue's, I'm now quoting myself, we're at serious risk of having an authoritarian demagogue take over this country. That was before, I wasn't thinking of Trump at all. It was written. Can you read my palm now? <laughs> no, but what I'm trying to say is that, so I, 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 the, f the first point I made was to be really excited about this upper third mobilization that's occurring now, because that could turn things around. But we, the disengagement is not a generic disengagement among right. young people. It's this disengagement among people that, frankly, we, and I say we here, I mean educated, 
um, coastal elites, and I'm an educated coastal elite, have completely forgotten about. And, and at some point, somebody will do research on white working class versus minority working class and how they feel. But I'm assuming that if you are alone all day with your phone, you're much more likely to believe the story about the pedophilia ring in the pizza parlor in Washington. Absolutely. And if you are going to your bowling league or your church group where you can say, hey, did you hear about that thing? And then your friend says, are you out of your mind? That's a good <laughs> you know, point. That's, that's exactly right. False. It's completely so, you right. You know, that's the thing. The more atomized people are, the more they can be manipulated and controlled, et cetera, et cetera. So. And, and I think the Twitter announcement this week that they changed the algorithm is going to make that even worse. I, I basically, t I don't know tons about this, but I think we're, I heard it on NPR, but the Twitter, it used to be, you you'd basically would subscribe to different people. You'd follow them and you'd get their stuff. And now they've created an algorithm so that you don't get all their stuff. You get the stuff that's like the stuff that, they'll send you stuff that's like stuff you like so that you are. not actually following people anymore? No, you're still following people but they've added a layer of this is stuff we think you would like. So it's 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 a level of auto, you know algorithm curation that so is going to make it even you more followed that they think you're going to like. I, I think so. So they're not going to. You've hit the limit it. of my knowledge. I heard it on the radio, but I I think it's you know it's it's along the trend of what yeah. you're talking about. And I just went about. Um, it's kind of funny because I I used to have a consulting practice and I was working with a nonprofit. It was probably about I don't know, eight years ago six or eight years ago, maybe around then. And we had to do scenario planning. And if you've ever done scenario planning, you basically kind of go, well, here's what might happen. Here's a different, you know, scenario. And then here's the really bad, scary one, but we need to plan for that too. And our really bad, scary scenario, which we called snakes on a plane, um, essentially involved um, a huge amount of social segregation across class income, et cetera. So it was the thing like, oh, if you pay extra, you can be in a faster line at the airport. <laughs> um, it was things like, if you pay extra, you can have you know, faster internet, which is about to happen. Yes. Um, and, and so, you know, the whole set of things that enable people to, you know, it, it's, it's the schools becoming more segregated, not less. It's, it's stuff like that. That's really happened. I mean, it, well, it it's public life happened. being privatized. Yeah. And it's, it yeah. is going to divide us further. So which is why we need national service, but we need it in a specific way. We need it, you know, designed thoughtfully through programs that have funding so that, you know, it isn't just, you know, work fair or something that is not going to have the kind of social impact that it can have. But we also need like tons and tons and tons of knitting clubs and book clubs and, and Tupperware parties and all of these little indivisible groups. It doesn't matter whether they're on the right or the left. The Tea Party did do this and they became a permanent energy source for the grassroots of the Republican Party. They did not split off and form a third party. They could have, but they didn't. And what we're waiting to find out is whether all of this energy, it seems like, on the left or among the Democratic grassroots, is that going to end up being Occupy Wall Street, which pretty much fizzled, or is it going to be the Democratic version of the Tea Party? We don't know, but that's what everyone is asking and wondering. Are we ready to open it up? For you, for questions, please, I guess, stand, go to the mics. Is that the plan? Okay. Um, what I'm, um, you know, what, what, while you're lining up, the thing that really struck me about what Bob said about Tahir Square, the sophisticated globalist liberal, whatever we want to call them, the internet connected people really weren't sticky enough. The internet is not sticky enough. You have to have a real shared values. You have to have a real, you know, community, which the military was and the Muslim Brotherhood was. Yes. And I guess my question is, you know, how do you make that? And you have to have structures for that. There used to be you know, how, how does a political party start that? I mean, my father, who grew up in New York a very long time ago, used to go to Workman Circles meetings. He only went there for the snacks, you know, but he went there. You know, he went there. He just went there to get a snack, but I bet something else happened while he was there. But there's, I don't want to get too academic about it, but there's a, there's a, pattern to American history. At the beginning of the 20th century, we were in very much the same kind of I society that we're in now. That is, it was not, it was great, very unequal. The, the, the earlier forms of social capital, that is the 
church, uh, you know, barn raisings and so on didn't cut it. And then there was a period of very, very creative grassroots mobilization. The worker, the workers circles that you're talking about come out of exactly that period and came out of a period of mobilization. And that's why I think, you know, we're, we're what or we are maybe six weeks into it now. So we don't know how long this is going to last. But that's the promise or that's the potential, I think, that these new things. Yeah, and, have. and, and I've always thought that in addition to, uh, to national service, well, OK, my, my little pet peeves are civics education, K through 12. Right. But, um, all, all these these liberal private schools, progressive private schools where we send our kids, they should require the state of the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah, absolutely. So they can have a big argument about it. Great. But say it and let's talk about why we do it and what nationalism means and doesn't mean. Right. Um, also, there should be the um, millennial homesteading program where no liberal kid who gets out of college is allowed to move to New York or California before they've lived in one of 10 swing states. <laughs> and no conservative kid who gets out of college is allowed to go to a red state. They have to move to, to, to uh, New York or California or Florida. Um, so I have a lot of programs. Um, anyway. You are a revolutionary. <laughs> oh. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, thank you for being here. My name is Jamie. I'm a junior. Uh, so I wanted to ask, hi, Dr. Levine, uh, my question is predominantly about your work, but I'm sure that every person would have uh, something to say about this, which is, um, I love hearing your optimism tonight. It makes me feel a little bit more optimistic, but I would like to know what you think about the sort of trends in, toward authoritarianism that we've seen, not just in the United States, but um, just the idea that there are fewer, uh, I know, Dr. Levine, you've written about the idea that fewer people uh, feel it's important to live in a democracy than they did, you know, 15, 30 years ago. And whether you think that that's important, whether you think that we need to be uh, doing anything to try to write that course. Yeah, actually, I mean, I remember asking Bob about nine months ago whether he was, his current project was going to be comparative and international because it's an immediate question is why do we see very similar phenomena in a bunch of countries. It's been sort of startling to me because for the last three years I've been able to work um, annually in Ukraine. And I felt at the beginning of that as if we were bringing some ideas from America to, to Ukraine. Now we are living in the same political order, um, to exaggerate a bit. So yeah, no, I, uh, and then some of the explanations we might give for changes in the United States in our civic culture don't immediately apply in other countries. And yet the, the pattern of, so, so, just, so I don't know the answer to your question, but just to make it hard. I mean, if you look Philippines, Russia, India, uh, Poland, Hungary, um, pro po quite likely France, France dep England, yeah. depending on how you write. And then, and, and, and so, and then several, well, and a number of, uh, well, even South Africa in, in a way, it's a global phenomenon. It's all, it's all powerful sort of male figures with macho, um, agendas, with a, sen a, a, a sense of the country as having a single unified um, personality that they represent, um, no tolerance for dissent or for civic, for civil society. Um, it doesn't, nothing like this have we seen since the 1930s. Except for one of the best salespersons for the anti-globalization movement as a woman, Marine Le Pen has figured out how to do this really, really well. But anyway, yeah. I, it scares the bejesus out of me. If you're asking, should yeah. we be worried about it? You betcha. I mean, scares the bejesus out of me. And, you know, exactly what we do about it, I don't know. But, you know, there is a global movement against globalization and all of the ways it hasn't paid off for people. And, you know, it's to both parties discredit that they never paid attention to the losers in globalization. And there were plenty of them. And I don't know if the answer was more trade adjustment assistance or more education or whatever, or more job training. But, but um, you know, there was definitely not enough understanding about what it means to have communities hollowed out and when work disappears. You know, that's also scary. You know, labor participation rate for men aged 25 to 54 is like falling off a cliff. Yeah, um, it's, there's an interesting aspect. It turns out social capital does actually, but being in a bowling league, uh, or the, not being in bowling league predicts support for Trump. That is, there is actually data on this now that I don't mean just yeah, literally. The more aggregated you are, the more you support Trump? No, the more connected you are, the less you support oh, okay, Trump. Okay, okay. And the, uh, that, and the, but the, it's even stronger with respect to places. If you live in a place which has been hollowed out by 
globalization. Even if you happen to be a barber and therefore you haven't lost your job because they're not going to send barbershops to, to China, you're depressed and you're likely to vote for Trump. That is, it's a, an aggregate phenomenon. Is that making sense? I mean, it's not just, so it wouldn't have been enough just to give every person who in, in my hometown who lost their jobs working in the local factory mm -hmm. when the, the parts were then made in. Mm -hmm. It's not just it's not just an individual phenomenon. It's a kind of a collective sense that the rest of us have forgotten that whole place, not just those right. people. And and I guess in the past, and our academics could tell us better. But there's all you know, capitalism is always changing, and people are moving. Sure. Of course, now people don't move as much as they did, which is amazing. Since the jobs are moving, they're disappearing. Why you know? But but um, in various times in American history, there were great upheavals and work changed. And we went from, you know, agri agrarian to industrial to service economy to the, you know, information age. But um, the sense of gr of grievance and humiliation that, that Trump was able to tap into is so powerful. And, um, you know, that's something that just hasn't, hasn't been attended to. Just to add one other thing, this, these, these explanations, including mine, have been well, I didn't really explain it, but have been uh, sociological or economics. Um, I think there's also an I, a kind of ideas gap. There, there hasn't been a powerful vision articulated, especially by something as big as a party, in any of those countries in favor of a, of a democratic vision. Right? There's been a sort of technocratic vision, and then there's been authoritarian. Certainly, Barack Obama himself told a wonderful story about American democracy, but I don't think that carried over beyond. And it's hard to name somebody with a similar role in other countries. So I think there's an idea. Democracy is hard to make work. It has lots of intrinsic flaws and failures. Well, got to hear the. Well, what was the great nationalist communal project that got us out of the depression? World War II. We don't really want that. But we also we also <laughs> had Franklin Roosevelt, right? I mean, we so you've got not not. Yes. I don't want it's not a great person theory. Well, and tremendous amounts of government created communal structures. But I mean, also about you know, orienting ideas. Yeah. That's, that's the book I'm writing, so I'm trying to... Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Dowd. I'm a senior here at Tufts. I'd like to discuss, uh, we'll hear from you around this crossroads that I think we're reaching where our economy is increasingly digitized. We have people starting businesses and operating our economy completely on the web. Yet, from an infrastructure standpoint, when it comes to the digital divide, we're something like 70th in the international community in terms of our dedication to bridging that gap. And it was certainly something that the Obama era cared a lot about. Now, with the appointment of a new uh, Federal Communications Commission director, that seems to be on ice. Um, what is going to be our generation's role, or what do you hope our role to be in taking our digital upbringing, mixing that with service, and using that as a tool for unification, civic engagement, not just in a, from a regional standpoint, but uh, at the national level as well. So I, I think this is an area actually that is could be an important growth area for service opportunities. Um, there's, you know, so a lot of the digital divide has to do with, um, you know, pieces that I don't think service will help with policies about rates and ways that, you know, uh, the actual capability is brought about. But the ability to use technology is something that, uh, you know, it's a well-known story that young people are much more able to adapt to, to technology than other folks and people haven't had experience with it. You know, that's that's a perfect way to, to get young people out there, you know, experiencing um, parts of the world they might not know and bring something to the table that they, they naturally have. I actually think, you know, I've been, I've been very interested in following like works like Clay Christensen's work and others who have, you know, thought about the disruptive way that technology is addressed is, is, you know, could potentially disrupt education and is seemingly starting to and healthcare and a whole variety of things. And in all of those cases, you kind of have a, a situation where you have a technology solution that allows for individualization or allows for some kind of a remote, um, you know, access. But you often do need somebody there who has, who's just going to help. I mean, I've been talking to folks around, um, 
legal legal access, civil legal access, that there, there's so much that can be done now if you have the right computer forms and you can, but if you don't know how to fill it out and you don't know how to even turn on the computer program and you don't know what does this mean, you know, those are things where you, you used to need a professional to be in the classroom. You used to need a professional to be the healthcare deliverer. You used to need a professional to be your lawyer. Now with appropriate technology, those things can be done with a smart layperson helping you, a caring layperson helping you, and potentially have greater outcomes. So I'm tremendously excited about all things digital, but you know that's the area where I kind of think there's a meetup with the kind of work that I'm doing. I'm, I want to add a couple of points to that good set of points you were making. First of all, on the digital divide. If by digital divide we mean, as we did mean originally, access to the internet, the digital divide is closing rapidly and with each new that digital divide in that sense, do you have access to this widget or to the, to the internet or do you have high speed access, whatever? Not only are those gaps closing, each successive gap is closing faster. So it's not that these poor kids that I'm worried about do not have a cell phone or a smartphone, they do. It's what's now becoming clear is there's a second digital divide which is deeper than that, which is how, how do you have people around you can help you use that in a productive way rather than just surfing and you know, watching porn and, and following tweets and so on? And that's the real di difference between the kids on the upside and the kids on the downside. It's not these people have the internet and these people don't. It's that these people have, and, and it's, it's, they have the software. By which software? I mean the people where around them. They're surrounded by people. Their peers and their parents and their teachers and so on, if you're on that upside, and probably all of us in this room are on that upside, actually. We have people around us who can tell us how to use this stuff. And we're using it better and better to connect to ourselves. But these other people, even though they have the, it's, I'm just trying to say it's not the access to technology. And I get driven up the wall sometimes because I talk to people about these same sorts of questions in Silicon Valley. And somebody said to me about a whole string of problems. Yeah, we got an app for that. Yeah, we got an app for that. And I said, but these kids don't have somebody to hug them. Yeah, we got an app for that. That's to miss the whole point. So I worry about this techno optimism that it, it works for us who have the connections, but would not help at all for the people at the other end. So let me make that in a positive way. The more we can think about ways to build alloys, that is an alloy is something that is both face to face and internet based, the better off we are. That's the challenge. Not just having another app that gives you quicker access to, you know, the six best graduate schools for you or whatever. <laughs> Hi, um, so I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come talk to us about this. Um, so my name's Jaya, I'm a sophomore here at Tufts. And my question is, so earlier we were talking about um, this huge surge of protests and activism um, amongst younger people and basically all across America. And we were talking about whether um, this would turn into more of an Occupy Wall Street situation and kind of fizzle out, or if it'll become more of a Democratic Party, Tea Party type thing. Um, so my question is, how do we make sure to maintain that activism and civic engagement? Because even at Tufts, I've seen in the last three months, um, things kind of calm down and people not being as willing to go out and do um, something to kind of fight against this Trump's agenda right now. So, Well, you know... <coughs> I have I had so many friends who came for the women's march who st stayed with me and of course I wasn't allowed to march and I did not, um, but they all wanted to know. Okay, now what do we do? You know, here they are. They live in blue states. Right. They want to go and register people in swing states, and it's getting harder to register. And they want to help them get whatever piece of complicated ID they need or whatever it is. And so I started calling around some of my friends who do this kind of stuff. And you know, you know how it takes a lot of work to have an intern? You have to be ready to accept volunteers. You have to have, you know, you mm -hmm. so 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 structures have to exist for people to plug into. But even before that happens, and I hope it, it happens soon, because there are a lot of people out there who really want to do something practical, 
But there has to be some kind of disciplined, organized thing that you do. Maybe you meet, maybe it's like the equivalent of a book club, only it's a political club, and you meet once a week and you do something. Or you just have a program, kind of like exercising, only instead of exercising at the gym, you exercise your civic duty and you make three calls a week to an elected official. You send $15. Those are things you do by yourself you know, $15 a week to whatever organization you want to support, but something that you do every, you know, regularly, and maybe you do it with a group of people. But I think that after the cathartic, wonderful communal experience of going and marching with millions of people, it's kind of up to you guys to form yourselves into little groups that keep on meeting and are sticky and, and do something, even if they're simple civic tasks that you just do them continually. Can I, can I add one more thing to that? I agree with that. But there's another point. Donuts or knitting. That is, don't think just about the politics, even though it's intended to be a politics thing, or the bowling. That is to say, think about the fact you're trying to build real connections with other real people. And even political scientists do not spend 100% of our time thinking about politics. And you, somebody in the group has got to be focused on, on that that is the cruise director. Uh, is this making sense? I mean, and people are not going to show up every week to lick more envelopes or to send, make more calls. There's got to be some fun to it and some non-politics part of it. And, and that's the part that I think, actually, it slightly encourages me that some of these new groups are conscious of that. And any organizer knows that. It, it's can't, it can't be just start always getting up, not just make all spinach. Make it a point to start a group like, you know, before the end of March, get five people together and just form a group that's going to do something together over and over and over again, just for the hell of it. Right. I'm going to unveil my, my acronym for the social movement. What you need is, and I haven't said this in, a, in an oral setting before, what you need is spud. <laughs> you need scale, you need pluralism, you need unity, and you need depth. And it's hard because they, they trade off against each other. Scale, you need a lot of people, although it's not your responsibility alone to get a lot of people. Pluralism, you need people who are different, including have different views and strategies, because groups that are uniform get stupid, mm -hmm. and they don't reach the median voter. Um, you need unity, because that's what everybody does when they all march to Washington on the same day. They're demonstrating unity. And you need depth, which is personal change. So people have to go into a movement and come out looking different. So I think that if you look at the civil rights movement, which is the only thing I really ever turn to. I have a, a whole book case of books about the civil rights movement. I think they achieved spud for about 10 years. And the question for me right now is basically, can you guys, well, I'm part of it too, but can we create some spud? Spud college? I think we, <laughs> maybe not. It didn't pull, it didn't pull very well. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, thank you for being here, Dr. Put Putnam and Mrs. Ms. Uh, Sagawa and, uh, and Dr. You're Levine. You're all buddy and Peter. Yeah, and, and, and Peter, being in Peter's class uh, is what introduced me to your work, Dr. Putnam. So uh, Peter, has, Peter has taught, taught some of your, your reading. Um, uh, Favorably, right, right, Phil? Sorry? Favor favorably. Yeah, no, favor favorably. Very favor favorably. And, and, and I think an um, important lens of the conversation as like a person of color in the, in the room uh, to think about um, social capital. Two, two quick uh, comments. One, um, as a person who spent a lot of my time here thinking about like building a tech nonprofit uh, from the community college space, like leveraging technology as well as human beings like success coaches or as an AmeriCorps alum, fundamentally like young people like myself are thinking about how do we have hybrid ways of engaging right. of technology and of human capital and social capital because neither technology is not the only solution and people are at the center of you know, um, how we move forward from a behavioral standpoint. Um, that's my, my, uh, my one point. Um, I guess I, uh, my initial quick, quick question on the national service piece uh, is as, as a you know, city year alum and blah, 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 and AmeriCorps, that kind of thing um, that I'm a huge proponent of is a lot that came up, I know, in the city, city year alumni community, also with the rising costs of urban, devel you know, urban development um, in cities and urban centers all across America, went all across America in the summer with the Millennial Trains Project, how do you see national service um, as a lens that's accessible for people when um, the idea of sacrifice, who can make that sacrifice, and the cost of living is increasing? How does AmeriCorps and alumni and organizations that believe in national service 
keep up with that. That's that's um, one question. And my larger question to the group um, is to say that um, I wanted to ask uh, what's the role of of the of the sphere and of pushing capitalism. A lot of millennials, millennials of color, a lot of the activists. Uh, a lot of people in the corporate sector are looking at capitalism and how do we reform it, how to reimagine it. That's at Harvard Business School. That's everywhere. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, y- you you mentioned the marginalized people of color who are not um, who are not voting, and if you have thoughts in part of pushing capitalism and and being engaged in the public sphere. And I take Chance the Rapper, for instance, uh, in Chicago. You know who is. Pers- uh, uh, whose father was in politics, you know, for the mayor of um, Chicago Daily, uh, gave a million dollars because he believes the governor is not doing his job and they're not funding public schools. And he's also gotten young people of color and other people to vote. So I'm wondering if you have any commentary on that. So the first piece on national service and any, and any commentary on marginalized communities and getting folks engaged and believing in stuff. So I'm happy to take the national service comment. Um, Well, if we had a different result in the election, we had a whole bill ready to go (laughs) that would have addressed some of this by having regional living allowance differences. And, you know, uh, even with even without um, the election going in that direction, we're still trying to work on that. So we've got a, a, a. senator who's introducing legislation to uh, make the uh, living allowance tax free. So that will go farther. Um, we're, we're trying to figure out some housing solutions. Our organization is trying to, on behalf of the entire field, negotiate some corporate partnerships. We're still in the baby stages of that, but we've got Airbnb supporting transitional housing. We've got a grocery chain that is going to be offering free groceries to a select number of people serving. Mm. And we're looking for other ways to kind of so the national service isn't something the government pays for. Government leverage it, uses its resources to leverage your activity and thank you for your service. But everybody in society should honor that and support it in different ways. So does somebody have a room in their house they can offer to an AmeriCorps member? Does somebody have a business that you know would give a discount to everybody who came in? who you know, could show that they were serving. I, I think there's a lot more we could do as a society mm-hmm. to make it easier to live on that very modest stipend and to honor your service the way that um, we honor military service. Mm-hmm. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. And your second question about how do we engage the disenf- you know, disenfranchised, which yeah. was thing, how do we engage disen, you know, we, you know, the panels, you know, people of color are not, you know, on the panel, not of anything. And we talked about, we, we talked about marginalized communities of color right. in this panel. And so I'm wondering, I use that example of Chance the Rapper, someone who's a millennial, who's an artist who gave a million dollars to public schools and is raising more money. Right. He's taken, literally taken his, his fans to the polls to vote and has initiatives around voting, engaging. And so any thoughts around the, the comments in the public sphere and including those people? Uh, I, I don't... No, is the answer, my answer to that question. What I, my only direct connection with that problem are the kids of all races, actually, mm-hmm. that we talked with and when we were writing the book, Our Kids. We talked with a lot of poor kids. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're str- all of these kids are struggling so hard just to stay alive, honestly. Mm-hmm. They're living in terrible conditions. They don't have good education. I mean, I'm they've got um, some at some point they've got some many of them have real strengths they i could not survive in the situation they're living in not so much the the material situation but the the sort of situation of isolation which you can't trust anybody so i i and when we talked to them about politics it was the furthest thing from their mind they saw no connection between politics and their conditions of life so help me how can we how can we systematically, I don't mean going one-on-one and saying, look, say, my saying to Mary Sue, look, you, you don't like the things that are in your life? That's not the right answer to your problems. Mm-hmm. It's that link, is this making sense? It's the yeah, linkage absolutely. between the real problems in their daily lives and politics, which seems like something else. Absolutely, I think in the, because people have questions, but I think it's, it's been hard for me to center just to focus on the civics when everything is interconnected. Yes. And so the civics and what the... Uh, the former Supreme Court Justice with I Civics and helping the in generation sitting help it, generation citizen helping people of color, young people of color understand the role of government, what it plays in their lives. Having people like Chance Rapper, um, you know, have other people follow his 
and enlighten to make that connection as well as adults, as young millennials, I think, and his, their outreach on social media and their ability right. to reach people is one way of getting folks invested in understanding that connectivity. To not look at it just as bifurcated or separated. Right. And it but sounds like what Chance the Rapper is doing is so much more direct as opposed to just having some Hollywood celebrity give a concert for Hillary. Yes, exactly. You know, That's like, right. Who cares about that? But, you know, and also the whole idea of, um, you know, this is just one little anecdote, but a f friend of mine who runs the Brennan Center, you know, who does all this voting rights stuff, you know, he had an intern. She was from Indiana. I think she was an Indian American, you know, woman. And she decided she's not going to stay in New York and get a job at a big, fancy nonprofit. She's going to go back to Indiana, mm -hmm. eventually try to run for something. I mean, the closer you get, the, 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 the what what is that? Subsidiarity. The closer, the, Absolutely. the more local you get. And it sounds like that's what Chance the Rapper is doing. He's not just talking about huge global things. He's talking about Chicago. Right. You know, um, and, and connecting to something in your community. And, you know, I think this is just anecdotal. And what I worry is that all of that energy from the marches and the town meetings is going to dissipate. But for people, when, when you hear these people interviewed to say, you know what, I'm going to run for school board. Yeah. You know what, I'm going to just people, if you don't even know what makes a democracy, if you don't understand all the little Small in small, medium, and large institutions that make up a democracy, you won't even know when they start to disappear. Um, but getting connected to them, you know, in your community is really important. And you know, for a long time, the big rap against Democratic voters is they only thought that presidential elections were sexy. Obama used to complain about this all the time, and they just could care less about midterms or their local elections. Republicans were never that way. They understood you have to turn out every single time and get involved. And that's why that's the great um, promise of what we're seeing now. We don't know if it's going to go anywhere, but that's the great promise. Can I say one really quick thing? Because Dorothy yeah, Stoneman is here. <laughs> and, all right, you say it then. Oh, well, no, I didn't mean to preempt you, but I wanted to say, I, because the, Dorothy's the answer in part, uh, or exemplifies the answer. So, so Youth Build, um, first of all, is it, to, you know, to Phil's question, Youth Build is a social enterprise around for 30 Sorry. Does everybody know who we're talking about? That woman there, Dorothy Stoneman, is one of America's saints. She right. happens to be with us today. So, so, true. So, so it's a, it's a, it's a social enterprise. So it's a, it's an economic uh, form that's that's thrived. Um, it takes in young people, almost all, uh, all working class, all college, all high school dropouts, and predominantly people of color. Um, because it, it and the reason they enter is because it offers uh, a path to jobs through GED and, and job skills. I interviewed one kid who said literally the flyer had hit his shoe and he picked it up and it said um, that there was a chance to get jobs. But then once you're in, it creates a very tight community among the young people with caring adults who actually use the L word love for the kids. Um, and then develops their civic and political leadership so that there's probably no other, I don't think there is any other pathway for someone to be a high school dropout at time one and now to be a, an elected official other than youth build. Youth build costs some money and we need a lot more of it. Absolutely. We have that time, we're exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> exactly, you said it better though. Now. I think we have time for just okay. one more, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Hi, everyone. I just wanted to echo again and thank you for your time. And hi, Dorothy. I'm a former Youth Build intern, so I just want to give a shout out there. Um, so I thought it was a really astute observation to talk about how political our generation is in terms of us wearing and eating and shopping our political beliefs. Um, and something that's definitely emerged over the past couple of months in terms of this presidential election is how divided we are and how we have really vilified the people who are our peers and our, our community, our brothers and sisters uh, in our cities and our schools, et cetera. So I was hoping you guys could talk a little bit about how can our generation be better and what are some steps that we can take as a very political generation to direct our actions and our, um, our beliefs to be more open towards discussion and to hearing more opinions, even if you disagree vehemently with those opinions. I, I'll just say something really, really quick. First of all, I think this is really important as a journalist. I'm, you know, I work for NPR, but I also appear on Fox News. So I'm the exception that proves the rule about media polarization. And, you know, they say Fox and MSNBC doesn't, don't even cover the same natural disasters anymore. <laughs> but so my, my thing is, how about listening to something or reading some media that you don't agree with, you know, getting out of your silo, information silo, that's one thing. 
Um, and um, that that's, you know, really, really important. And the other thing is just to quote Obama in that last speech that he gave where he said, if you're tired of arguing with someone who doesn't agree with you on the internet, how about going and talking to them in real life? Um, the larger picture um, is that your generation is coming of age after 30 or 40 years of steady, growing class and geographic segregation in America. It, nor, it, it didn't used to be like this. There's been some improvement in racial segregation, actually, some racial desegregation over the last 30 or 40 years, but there's been a massive increase in class segregation. That's true in terms of where people live. It's, terms, it's true in terms of who you go to school with. It's in terms, of, in terms of whom you marry. There are many fewer marriages now between people from the wrong side and the right side of the tracks. Why? Because they're just encountering one another less. So it is partly this affirmative, uh, you know, being an intelligent consumer of news, but it's partly you have to you have to go out of your way more i don't mean you personally i mean your cohort has to go out of your way much more than i did because when i was growing up ages ago america was not such a segregated society i grew up in a small town most of my friends dads worked with their hands so i have lots of my friends growing up who were kids of manual workers and are themselves manual workers i didn't have to you know, reach out to be some kind of saint. It's just that's the way American society was organized. It's harder for you because you're in a situation in which all of the structures of our society have become much more segregated, including our universities, but the universities are the least of it. I mean, they're an important part of it for us who are in universities, but it's true in all aspects of our life. Our churches are more segregated by class than they used to. So, uh, and that's not telling you what you should do, but it's telling you that's the plight that you're in, that you're having to swim upstream in a way that Americans didn't used to. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. No, it's okay. No, no, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh, well, first of all, I was welcoming the question because I think that that urge is um, is a very valuable urge. That's a civic, that's a civic goal. Um, yeah, and... Right, I think that's the most, you, you hit the most important sort of context. Peter Levine's agent, and I can't seem to get him out of his shell. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shirley, Peter, Bob, Mara, thank you very much. This was an enormous treat. <laughs> I want to thank you for raising our spirits for having us leave tonight, you know, energized to do something. I do suggest that everybody go to civicyouth.org tomorrow, learn a lot about what young voters did in this election and didn't do, and, and a lot about who did not vote and why they did not vote. And you're right, a lot of, one of the interesting things is that among moderate young independents, 17% voted for third party candidates. So in any event, we always, I was telling Shirley earlier, we always give presents to people who grace us with their wisdom and their time. And so I have for each of you a, a Tufts, a Tisch College uh, Moleskine notebook with oh. pen. And for tomorrow morning's coffee, and I won't take it out of the box, a Tisch College coffee cup. Uh, Everybody who is here tonight, I want uh, to dub you, if you're a student, then you're a Tisch College student. If you're an alumni, alumnus, you're a Tisch College alum. If you're a friend, you're a Tisch College friend, and I put you all in that category. Uh, one of the ways that we can learn to talk across differences is by convening uh, gatherings like this with a variety of viewpoints. And Tisch, with its Distinguished Speaker Series and its Civic Life Lunches, will continue to do that, and I hope you will continue to join us. So there's a reception in the Hall of Flags, and thank you very much for joining us.